So when I began doing research on the wager, um, I spent the first two years um, doing research in a way suited for my very paltry physical attributes, which was in archives, uh, primarily in England, the turning my office into an archive, especially during COVID. And, um, uh, but there came a certain point, as there often does when research, where you're always not, it's a little bit like the last box. You're, you're not, not by what you know, but by what you don't know. And how can you fully understand what other people went through in time and space, another period, in another part of the world, um, unless you gather every piece of intel you can about them and their experience. Um, you were trying to get as close to other people's consciousness as physically possible, even when you have the barrier of time and death. In the case of the wager, these people have been deceased for centuries. And then we have to go out into the ocean. We can no longer stay in these little sheltered channels. So I was feeling pretty confident at that point, headed out into the ocean, and right away I got my first glimpse of these seas. And let's just say um, they are some really big seas, and that boat was very ill-suited uh, for those seas. Um, it got so rough that all you could do was to sit down on the deck of the boat, um, because if you stood, you would break a limb, and you had to just hold on and hunker down. Um, and the boat was, it was like kind of like being in a ping pong ball. Um, and you would just get tossed from one side to the other, um, hanging on. Things were like flying past me, bilge pumps and jackets. I, in my inordinate wisdom, decided that I needed to come up with something to distract me and pass the time. So my solution to that was, well, I have Moby Dick on my cell phone. Why don't I listen to that? Which is a wonderful novel, um, but really ill-advised uh, to listen to uh, when you're about to puke. And um, I also had every uh, seasickness medicine known to humankind being tested out on my little body. Uh, I had the thing behind the ear and the mysterious band around my wrist that I was basically drunk on uh, Dramamine. Um, but I sat there and then eventually we did get out uh, into what was known as the Gulf of Pena, Gulf of Penas, which translates as the Gulf of Sorrows, or some prefer to call it, and as I like to call it, the Gulf of Pain. Um, and uh, our captain was very skilled, and he did manage to lead us across it. So that's a very long prelude to your question. What did I learn? Well, one, I learned that um, don't listen to Moby Dick of those seas. No, I learned, uh, I got a glimpse of what those seas were really like uh, for these people, and then I eventually got to Wager Island. Uh, we got off, we anchored, we got on like a basically like a Zodiac, a little small boat. We went on to the island, bundled up in about, you know, eight layers of clothing. It was winter time, it was sleeting. Um, it always kind of, it's a place where it always rains or sleets. It's always windy. And it, one of the revelations that occurred to me, which had it occurred to me is, in their journals, the seamen, the castaways on the side of them, because they were stranded there for weeks and weeks, months, um, uh, would always say they were freezing. And I was like, well, was, how cold could it be? And I kind of looked it up when I was back home in New York. So I was about 33. I was like, well, it's not the Antarctic. How cold was it? When you get there, you realize how cold it is because it's always wet and it's always blowing about 30 miles per hour off the sea. And so I realized, I was like, oh my God, and I was shivering and I was like, oh my God, they all had hypothermia. It hadn't even occurred to me. And that what isn't a term they would have ever used. They just said freezing, freezing it was kind of tedious. You know, I'll tell you, when you read journals about castaways starving and freezing, you get a lot of, I'm starving and I'm freezing over and over again. <laughs> um, but I suddenly kind of understood it to the bone, quite literally. Um, and then I looked at the island, which they had always described as desolate or windswept and uh, and having no food. And I was like, really, no food on the island? There's, how can there be no food on the island? And it turns out there's really no food on the island. Um, there are, are some uh, um, you know, snails and clams along the shore, but they exhausted that, the castaways, pretty quickly. And then there are some birds that kind of fly tantalizing close by, but there are no other animals on the island. Um, and so in that trip, it was a very important trip because I could finally understand these things that I had only read. 
One of the things I had read was a British officer who described it, the island as a place where the soul of the man dies. And I was like, okay, I get it now. And so even though, it, um, unlike in the my book Lost City of Z, where I went through the Amazon, I described my trip, I don't describe my trip in the book at all. Um, but it breathes life into my descriptions of the island, the seas, what it was like for them. Um, I could suddenly describe the mountains. I could describe the birds. But I really had a sense of at least a glimpse and a glimmer of what their suffering must have been like on that island. 